Welcome to part two of this Peel Hunt Renewable Energy and Clean Tech podcast with me, Nick Walker, Peel Hunt's Head of Renewable Energy, Clean Tech and Sustainability Research, and from Sarah's Power, CEO Phil Coldwell and Chief Commercial Officer Tony Cochran. Tony, let's talk about Delta. That was a very exciting announcement, I think 19th of January. It certainly injected some excitement into the share price, at least for a while. I remember 30% up intraday on my screen when that came out. It's a really interesting agreement. Uh, first of all, it's a, a new jurisdiction, Taiwan. It was a dual stack licensing arrangement for SOFC and OSOEC. That was the first, obviously, for the company. And Delta is a, is a huge company. It produces a lot of interesting sort of componentry with application markets across power and, you know, potentially uh, hydrogen production. So lots of end use cases. And, and obviously, it's got very interesting customers amongst them, people like Microsoft, Google, Amazon and Tesla, and obviously many others. What I'm interested to ask you about, first of all, is I think at the time when we had the analyst meeting on the day, you said that the sort of technology transfer was going to begin in the next week, and that you expected to have output on production lines from 2026. So it sounds like there's real pace, a real hunger for drive and speed. So I'd be interested just just to sort of talk about that. And and first of all, what are the key milestones sort of from today to production? And then what kind of products do you expect Delta to be making when they come off the production line? Will they be stacks that will be selling for other people to integrate into products or will they be making whole products? Good question. So first of all, not only the investor base, we're really excited. Everyone at Sarah's is really excited about this partner. They're from Taiwan, a region in the world where they really know how to manufacture at scale. They know how to manufacture with precision. They know how to manufacture at low cost. So this is uh, exciting because it really is going to test the commercial production viability of our technology. It's going to test the cost curve of our technology. And we're really excited that Delta is the kind of company that's going to do it at pace and with ambition. They have a very sophisticated manufacturing capability, which is one of the reasons we were attracted to them. They already make ceramic components. They make sensors. They make circuit boards. And so they already know how to manufacture using the types of processes that lend themselves well to Sarah's technology manufacture. But they also have complementary businesses that allow them to access the channel quite readily. So, you know, in the fuel cell world, it's a dual license. So they have to build a fuel cell business and an electrolyzer business. And, you know, data centers, for example, is a market that we've been touting for some time as a market that lends itself well to high efficiency fuel cell devices. And they already deliver power electronics to data centers. They deliver cooling systems to data centers. And uh, that kind of capability to bundle not only the fuel cell, but the auxiliary devices around it and sell it as a solution package is actually what's what the industry is trending towards. People don't want to buy components anymore. They want to buy solutions. And that solution sale capability with their own manufacturing components around it is quite a strong channel access point for them in some of the fuel cell markets. On the electrolyzer side, that's a newer market for them. It's a bigger industrial play for them but they use the same competencies. You still need power conversion devices to run an electrolyzer. So one of the most expensive subsystems in a hydrogen plant using an electrolyzer solution is actually converting AC to DC to feed the electrolyzer cells. And they already have that competency. Part of what we need to do to maximize efficiency is harvest heat from certain industrial processes. And they have a whole division of thermal management solutions that do that and do that extremely well. So they're going to be positioning their own products into the market, but the license also allows them to sell stacks to anyone else in the industry who might want to buy them. And that is a line of business they're interested in because they are very good at mass manufacturing and they know it. And so if there's a market for stacks that is incremental to their own needs, certainly their early indications are that they're more than willing to build it. Now, back to your first question, what happens between now and 2026 when that first factory comes online? Our business is to license not only a stack design, which is reversible, can produce electricity or can produce hydrogen, but we also license the manufacturing blueprint that enables someone to produce it. 
which is why we can accelerate the time from technology transfer to that manufacturing facility, because we can give them the equipment specifications, we can give them the factory design, and what they will be doing is they'll be sourcing local equipment, they'll be finding local suppliers for the components. They don't have to reinvent anything. It's already a standardized blueprint and a building block that they can modify to the Taiwanese supply chain context. And that allows them to move very, very quickly towards production. That, that sounds very exciting. Just quickly, one of the most exciting things that actually I think you said, Tony, on the analyst call after the Delta announcement was that in this particular instance, you as a company were going to be spending quite a bit of time talking to some of the end user customers, perhaps the data center guys, perhaps the people who who run sort of very large warehouses like Amazon, perhaps the cloud server people, people like that. And you were going to be talking to them, I believe, about kind of amongst the sort of fuel cell and electrolyzer technologies that you have, which Delta are going to manufacture, sort of as their strategy unfolds for decarbonization for the future, kind of how that sort of tripartite relationship between yourselves with Delta being the manufacturer and them as the customer, how that develops, how their strategy can evolve in terms of their decarbonization pathway. Can you just briefly give us a little bit of insight into that? Yeah, look, we're a technology and engineering company and we license that, but we really need to understand with precision how our technology interfaces with the end user value proposition. And so we take a very systems engineering approach to our development and our targeted research. We like having that interface to the end user, whether it be a steel mill or or an ammonia facility or a data center. We need to know what opportunities there are to enhance the attributes of the cells that we license so that they can either add better efficiencies or are easier to integrate with the site And uh, those relationships that, for example, Delta has with those major decarbonization companies allows us to have those conversations. And, you know, I'll give you a brief example. A a fuel cell produces a DC electrical output. Well, all the server racks in a data center use a DC input. But the industry at the moment is taking a whole bunch of steps up AC to DC and then DC step up and step down voltages to eventually get to feed the energy to the servers. Well, if you can integrate that and eliminate all those steps by creating a bespoke design for that application, then you can create a much more user-friendly and more efficient interface. And we wouldn't do that as a first step because the first step is to get into the market. But as this evolves over five, 10 years, we need to learn from this and make our product offering significantly better than than the previous generation. And that keeps the business healthy. Excellent. Phil, I'm keen to ask you about the latest developments with Bosch and Doosan. Both of those companies, I believe, should be ready to start actually manufacturing kit in the next few months. I think you announced in one of your recent announcements that there's been a modest delay. Sort of, We were expecting output second half of 2024. We're now looking probably at early 25. For both customers in turn, and I think, um, Tony, maybe you can chip in here. I think you said you were out in Korea, Doosan recently. So maybe with Bosch, first of all, Phil, can you give us a kind of sort of helicopter view of what the actual installations are looking like at the moment in terms of the manufacturing lines and the readiness and when you're expecting to start actually producing? And if you're able to, give us some insight into sort of what products you're expecting to produce if you can, and types of applications. Um, Let's start with Bosch first of all, and then we can move on to Doosan. Yeah, sure. So, you know, Bosch is a fantastic key partner for us. And one of the things that everybody knows about Bosch is the strength of their brand, the quality of their products. It also has made the bar has been extremely high, extremely rigorous in terms of what goes into product launches at Bosch. This is, uh, I think, the one record about a 500 million total investment, not just into the Serra's technology but into manufacturing of complete products and you ask about products it's a distributed power system initially running on natural gas that will be hydrogen ready for distributed power applications not dissimilar to the ones tony's just talked about data centers commercial buildings etc i've been and seen you know where they manufactured what we call the hot box the systems the pilot lines for the cells and now equipment is being installed for scale up i think you know we can't say exactly when production starts, but it. But the stage we're at is 
you know, we've been developing larger stack technology with them, I mentioned earlier, so the industrialization of that, you can imagine how vigorous the verification is, field testing, et cetera, that's all continuing this year. And then production will follow when, it, when it's ready, really. And when we talk about production, we're very focused on, obviously, you know, the stack production, but you have to appreciate it's not just the stack, the stack's not the product, it's the actual power system. So that's all, all going on in our, our relationship with Bosch is probably the closest of all our relationships. We go further and deeper into the technology and into the into the you know now onto the product verification and that side of things. So that's that's where we are with Bosch. I mean, Tony, you've been I think to career more recently than I have. Do you want to answer that one? Yeah, absolutely. So I was there a couple of weeks ago. Just a status update. It's public knowledge that the factory is uh, being commissioned this year. It's a fifth, notionally a 50 megawatt output factory, so not a huge factory, not as big as Bosch's, but uh, there's room for expansion at the site. It's just south of Korea. It's uh, in Kunsan, which uh, is on the coast. And look, the capability that they've built is, is, is tremendous. I mean, they've taken our technology and they've sourced equipment in Korea. They've found Korean supply chain for some of the key materials, which frankly are, are impressive in their cost potential. And uh, they already have, what's interesting is they already have a fuel, a healthy fuel cell business. So they have been selling their phosphoric acid solutions, which was an acquisition they made about uh, eight, ten years ago. So they already understand the market for provisioning fuel cells into the utility market in Korea quite well. And what's happening is because the phosphoric acid efficiency is only about 43% efficient in converting natural gas to electricity, they need a better solution because the competition that's coming into Korea is solid oxide competition. And so uh, they invested in this technology and they're working feverishly on the requirements of the utility business to mature that technology so they can position it at scale at power plants in Korea. And that's a subsidized market. There's very formal allotments of how much you have to provision at these sites. So there's not a lot of market risk for them. And really the game is mature the technology and then provision it as a better alternative to the phosphoric acid market they have today. They've also got a strong interest in the U.S. So their high axiom division is uh, starting to digest the opportunity that the U.S. market offers them. Again, they're currently selling the phosphoric acid solution, but as soon as the solid oxide fuel solution with Ceres technology is available, they intend to provision that into, into the U.S. as well. And is the schedule at the moment for them to start selling products in 2025? Yes, they already have line of sight to certain government allotments for provisioning in 2025. They also have a publicly announced marine program where they're going to be putting solid oxide fuel cells on a vessel to power the auxiliary electrical power on a ship. And so uh, that's part of how they're going to be using their factory later in the year and into 2025. I think one of the exciting things, if you take a step back from this, is we've got our own pilot production in the UK. We've been supporting Bosch in Germany. We've got this fantastic facility coming on stream in South Korea. We've just signed this deal with Delta in Taiwan. One of the things that's often leveled at the fuel cell industry is, you know, you're not able to scale and the supply chains don't exist. What we're seeing in action now is localization of supply chains, which are starting to cross fertilize each other as well. So, you know, we took our factory blueprint and then do sort of develop that with some homegrown technology and some localized supply chains. Some of those low cost suppliers are now coming back into and benefiting of other partners. And that's the way this works. And one of the reasons why the Delta deal is relatively quick is because this will be our third factory build. And every time we do it, we're getting better and better. And part of our product, if you like, is not just the cell technology, but it's the team of manufacturing engineers that are now extensively on spending a lot of time in Asia helping partners to scale. So a vision we've always had through licensing is don't try and do this all on your own try and localize simultaneously. And now we're actually building out these capability. And yeah, sometimes we've had some delays. We've had delays in Bosch. We've had some delays in the China JV, which we may talk about. However, fundamentally, strategically, we're building our presence as the choice solid oxide technology globally, backed up with huge balance sheets and huge capabilities. I mean, when you work with these companies, Bosch, Doosan, they're very high quality companies. They demand a lot of our people, 
But if you understand, if you could come into Sarah's, I mean, I've been in Sarah's 10 years, how far Sarah's has come, you understand if you could come in organization, because we've had to, because of the quality of the people that we work with. And now if you want a service technology license, you can go and see you know, world-class reference facilities coming on stream. I think that's a big tipping point for us that I think we're going to see more of in the, in the year ahead. Last couple of pieces. Let's talk quickly about China. Mm-hmm. Sadly, it didn't work out. The two JVs you had for Stacks and Systems between Ceres, Weichai and Bosch. Very quickly, can you just tell us why? And you've said, obviously, you're going to be looking at your China strategy now, still with Weichai. What do you see as the future for the company's strategy in China? To answer the first question, why didn't it work out? I think, you know, we we like big deals. And that was probably one of the biggest deals we'd ever done. And, And Tony worked on that with myself for about a year. And I think what ultimately, at the time, timing's everything. Unfortunately, with the investment decision at a time of interest rates rising, some, some pressures on the industries for Bosch uh, and Weichai in the automotive side, that would have been another big investment decision. So I think it was just a, a bit of a casualty at the time of not getting over the line. However, since then, I think the Chinese economy is starting to recover, but Weichai in particular is, is strong again. Uh, Bosch is continuing, but we are looking at, you know, we can't ignore that market. Wei Chai is a, is a key strategic partner for us. And, and indeed, still quite a big shareholder. And, and a power. big shareholder. So we're going to, you know, our, our intention is to keep moving forward with Wei Chai. Wei Chai are now developing 75 kilowatt stationary power units. And I think that's a, a great application in China. And also what we haven't seen yet is you've seen these big policy announcements in the US, in Europe, etc., don't forget, China operates on five-year plans, and we're between cycles. But the next five-year plan will reciprocate, I am sure, on green investment and probably go bigger again. So I think that, watch this space, but I think that China will, in the future, come out with big policy decisions, and then, and then we'll see a, a real takeoff, I think, in, in fuel cells and, and green hydrogen in China as well. So by no means are we strategically giving up on China. In fact, we're continuing on that. And I can't say much more, but because once bitten, twice shy, we had a deal that we thought was going to get over the line in China. It obviously didn't. But when we have next deals, we'll, we'll, we'll explain. And look, and our license with Weichai is still active. Yeah. Um, so our licensing business model to Weichai hasn't changed. And, uh, you know, the next steps in China with Weichai or others is something that can continue to be practiced under license and does not necessarily need a joint venture or something like that for it to enable market access for us. And so we're looking at some of those opportunities. Very good to hear. I mean, everything I read, you know, the data says that China is both going to be the biggest producers of hydrogen and the biggest uses of hydrogen yeah. going forward. Yeah. So clearly, it's good to hear that you're continuing efforts to to make that market work for you. And thank you very much. It's been a really interesting sort of canter across the world <laughs> in terms of services operations and indeed to sort of probe some of the uh, the near term and the sort of the, the more medium term opportunity of service. I think we'll close it there. But thanks very much indeed. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Thank you.